so we've been doing lots of different pieces of research on us um, in the last few years and we seem to have ended up focused in this sort of late medieval early modern period because that that's where well a a lot of the remains um aren't if you like so it's of a particular interest and um so this is what the talk is going to be about tonight it was andrew wright actually whose talk i joined uh, yes. a few weeks back. and i've had lots of contact with andrew since who's been really helpful in some of my thinking about what i'm going to talk about tonight so in fact i forgot to put him on my thank you list at the end but um uh, I've mentioned them now, so hopefully that's okay. So anyway, good evening, everyone, and many thanks for the invite to speak to you tonight from North Uris about one of the mysteries that has perplexed archaeologists in recent times, and that is why is there so little evidence of settlement on Uris in the 500-year period between the time the Norse ceded control of the Outer Hebrides in 1266 until the middle of the 18th century? Um, although I don't clearly don't come from the Outer Hebrides or even Scotland, I've lived around the West Coast for a good part of my adult life, starting in 1976 when I graduated as a young architect and moved with, with my wife Jean to Oban in Argyll. And after 15 years there, we moved south of England for a period, then abroad for a while before moving to US in 2007. I've always been interested in prehistory and started field surveying on US not long after we moved here. And I've been an active member of the local community archaeology group since around 2004. Before I start, I'm just going to quickly place North Uist in the context of the north of Scotland, which we can see in this slide here, where, and where I assume most of you in tonight's audience are tuned in for, although I think I picked up that at least one of us isn't. On the right of this slide, we have the have the whole Outer Hebrides chain with the Isle of Skye across the miniature to its east and with the island of North Uris highlighted in yellow. And the image on the left of this slide shows the island, or as I should say, group of islands, which make up North Uris in more detail. North Uris shares a common geography and land use with most other Outer Hebridean islands, with uh, Macha in the on the west coast and to the east, mountains, peat moors, and hundreds of lochs and lochens. I've also highlighted here the location of the Gary or Blackland areas, which lie just inland from the Maka, and which feature in a number feature a number of times in tonight's talk. And like many coastal areas of Scotland with sedimentary geology coastlines, North Uist has experienced significant coastal erosion not only over the last few, few millennia since the end of the last ice age, but also more recently. As a result, the blue lines shown here to the north and west of North US Monday coastlines are roughly where the coastline may have been as recently as the Norse period. And this included the, the land bridge to the outlying Monarch Islands seen here to the west. This link is widely recorded in local oral history and may still have existed at low tide as late as the 16th century. The reason for showing the slide is that there's a good possibility that much of the settlement we are looking for might well have disappeared through this coastal erosion process of Maka areas, which from the archaeological record appears to be the preferred location for human settlement here, right from Neolithic times. And talking of archaeology, it's worth just reviewing the work undertaken on Uist over the past century or so, and all of which I shall be referring to during the talk. I'm sure at least a few of these names are reasonably well known to you. Um, I, I know, for instance, that Ewan Campbell has been the subject of a series of lectures from Glasgow University. Uh, Erskine Beveridge wrote a sort of a, he was a, um, an archeologist who came to live on US in the, around the turn of the 1900th century and uh, wrote a very uh, big book about North US's um, older remains. And people like Mike Park Pierce and Neil Sharples, Neil Sharples, they're all reasonably well known today. After a significant burst of activity here in the 80s and 90s, little excavation work has been carried out here since the turn of the millennium, and surveyors from the Royal Commission, now Historic Environment Scotland, are rare visitors these days. This slide shows the areas of North Uist where I and my two survey colleagues, Simon Davis and Roger Auger, have been carrying out field survey work since around 2014. 
Initially, we concentrated on areas around US now inhabited, sorry, uninhabited East Coast, which was very poorly recorded previously. We recorded everything we saw during numerous survey visits, often gaining access by boat. More recently, we've been focusing on particular topics rather than areas of interest, such as so-called lost villages, island dunes, and black houses, or as they're referred to on US, thatched houses. We've published several survey reports and other books over the years, and all are available free of charge as PDFs. Roland has a list and the download links if anyone would like copies. I'm currently working on a survey of all the North US shielding sites, of which there are at least 100, and which I'm expecting to finish late next year or early in 23. Now, as regards the structure of tonight's talk, I should just point out that although all of you talk, most of my references will be to North Eurist alone, as this is the area I know best in terms of sites and history. And also, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to generalise comments on US history. And as a result, these may not stand up to detailed scrutiny in terms of exact numbers and dates, but they'll certainly suffice for tonight's purposes. And I'm going to proceed to discussing the question of late medieval and early modern settlement here with a brief history of what settlement patterns can be observed on US before 1266 and after around 1750. Then I'm going to describe the buildings that are known to have existed here in that 500 year late medieval early modern period. And then I'm going to outline the two different theories as to settlement development on US in the post Norse period and the views of other researchers who have studied these. And finally, I'm going to see how the results of our own survey work fit with these ideas, and then draw some very tentative conclusions, and I stress the word tentative. I'm going to start by summarizing the history of settlement on North US before and after the 500 year period we're just talking about, and when remains are largely absent. This slide covers the middle and later Iron Age periods during the first half of the first millennium, of which I'm sure you're all aware excludes any mention of the Romans. And like other parts of Northern Scotland, archaeological remains here from this period are dominated by brochs, island dunes and roundhouses with the occasional, as I call it, odd thing thrown in. North Eust is particularly renowned for its very large numbers of island dunes, 84 recorded so far and shown here as the yellow dots. And we think we found the remains of two more shown here as pink dots during recent survey work for Reading and Southampton University's Islands of Stone project. And here are some examples of these Iron Age structures on North Eurus. And I'm sure you're all familiar with these types of remains. We've got a typical brock with its double walls, a wheelhouse lower right, and a typical island, a small island doom, uh, lower left. The so-called odd thing I've selected, which is shown here top left, is a lookout place or hideaway where Iron Age remains were found. And it's located on a crag overlooking the Minch. And in fact, you can see sky on the horizon in the distance. Although well marked on maps, it's extremely difficult to locate in the landscape as you approach it, even from less than 100 meters away. It's not known if the Picts, or perhaps better to say Pictish influence, ever really took any hold on Eurus. As can be seen in this map slide, few remains from the period exist. Beyond that, of a small Pictish stone on a tidal island between North Eurus and Lambecula, the remains of two square cairns, and a small metalworking workshop dating to the 6th and 7th centuries in the northwest of the island discovered during excavations by Ian Armit in the 1980s. Elsewhere in the Hebrides, the few settlements from the period that have been located are based mainly on the reoccupation of dunes and roundhouses by the insertion of small stone walled cells, either within or alongside the original Iron Age structures. Uh, this is an aerial picture of Yellen Olivat, the site excavated by Ian Armit. It was situated on a 60 meter wide peninsula, which was surrounded by a dry stone wall. And on its low summit was a circular building around five meters in diameter with a central hearth. Although no metal objects, objects were found, 
remains of crucibles and molds reveal that fine jewelry such as handpins and penannular brooches, as well as small ingots were being made there in around 600 AD. There is little historic record of Viking raids in the Hebrides, but it is presumed they happened around the same time as those on Skye in around 800 AD. Quite what they found when they arrived, no one knows. The US never had any valuable natural resources or wealthy monasteries like Ireland and Iona, but it did have reasonable land for farming along its Maca coast and a series of sheltered harbours and coastal inlets facing the Vinch. The broadly accepted view at present is that the raids were probably short-lived, and before the Norse colonisations of Iceland began in the late 800s, Norse settlers had started to arrive in the Hebrides and establish small farming communities. Significant numbers of Norse period farmsteads were found during the search project on South Eurist in the 1990s, but nothing similar has ever been found on North Eurist. The only evidence here being small sets of Norse period finds, usually in the form of bow privets. Despite that, the near 500 year long period of Norse influence embedded itself in the island's place names, which are still in widespread use today. In fact, my survey colleague Roger Auger's work suggests that perhaps up to half of the island's 2,000 or so recorded place names may still contain Norse elements within their Gallic form, with as many as 350 still used in their original Old Norse form. In the context of so many Norse-related place names, the lack of Norse settlement on North Eurus remains is a mystery. Although, as mentioned before, it may be that the main areas of occupation and the related buildings have eroded into the sea. The only potential Norse related discovery we ever made was a small and unusually planned house on a peninsula called Leonish, which extends into a sheltered sea inlet off North Eurus south coast. Just an outline of, single, of a single course of stones on the ground surface, the two rectangular planned buildings connected by a short passage have a number of similarities with one of the Norse farmsteads excavated in the 1990s by Neil Sharples at Kilfeda on South Eurist, as shown here lower right. It is believed that these stone foundation outlines represented the base of peat or turf block walls, perhaps looking something like this Norse house reconstruction in Newfoundland, shown here lower right. <clears throat> Although to me personally, this looks rather like a copy of the Arnold Black House in Lewis just built in turf. This walling technique was widely used in the US right through into the 1930s, as shown in this photo up the left, and is repeatedly mentioned as a component of local houses in the writings of travellers to the Outer Hebrides in the 18th century. And it is, of course, the natural degradation of these walls to pretty much nothing. That is one of the most off-sited reasons given by historians and archaeologists for the absence of house remains in the late medieval, early modern periods. So let's just summarize settle, settlement developed on North Eurus in the first millennium AD up until 1266. Firstly, we've got a lot of Iron Age sites on North Eurus, probably more in terms of overall density than on Becula. We know there are plenty of unresolved arguments about which roundhouse form came first, whether they were contemporary in time, would they reflect a hierarchical society and where the construction ideas originated, but that is another discussion. There is little or no evidence of any Pictish presence or influence, and this applies to the whole of the list, although some houses dating to this period often associated with earlier Iron Age structures have been recorded further north. The influence and presence of the Norse on the US over an extended period is revealed by building remains and place names but no Norse buildings have ever been located on North Eurus. So let's now move forward 500 years from the time the Norse ceded control of the Hebrides in 1266 to the mid 18th century. The turbulent years of interclan rivalry and internecine murder and general mayhem between the MacDonalds, MacLeods of Skye, MacLeods of Lewis, Clan Ronald and the MacNeils of Barra are over. Clan Ronald holds South Eurist and Vendecula, and the McDonald's of Slate have, firmly been, have been firmly in control of North Eurus since around 1615. 
This was the heyday of the nucleated settlement known in Gaelic as the Bale, as opposed to Clacken or Toon, with which you might be more familiar, and the communal form of farming known as Runry. Despite that, in 1764, the North Eurist estate rentals showed that of the island's 40 or so recorded settlements, 20 tenancy tax farms, often rented by distant relatives of the McDonald's, although all would probably have included the houses of farm laborers and subtenants. This left only 13 settlements being held as multiple tenancies, in other words, as true bail, and these had widely varying tenant numbers between two and 29. And together, these 40 or so settlements housed a population estimated in 1755 by Alexander Webster to be around 1900. Few remains of these 18th century Balchine buildings can be seen today, as most were dismantled and their stone used to build new croft houses and field boundaries when the island's land holdings were reorganized into crofts in and after 1814. This is a uh, satellite image of one of the best preserved Illeray on the island of Ballashare. And just to point out, you can sometimes see maps in the top right hand corner of the screen with a yellow dot that shows where the places are I'm talking about. And Illeray had to be abandoned in 1814 as rising sea levels and erosion had resulted in most of the township's farmland being lost. The new cross was located about a mile away to the northeast and the area designated as common grazing, hence its better preservation. Despite that, many of the households were quarried to build a series of cattle enclosures and connected nights during the 19th century and are shown as grey lines in this recent survey plan. If we strip away these later enclosures, we can see how Illeray looked at the time it was abandoned, with its three clusters of multiple building farmsteads and their adjoining stack yards. These clusters were each situated on areas of slightly higher ground, with lower lying marshy areas in between. This is how Illeray looks in the air today, with its stone building remains and the later dry stone dikes cutting through them. And in the distance top right, you can now see the flooded former township fields uh, where the tide now comes in every day. Although taken by Erskine Beveridge in around 1900, this photo shows the township of Hogary, which for various reasons never changed from its original bale form. And this gives a good sense of what Illeray would have felt like as a place to live in the early 1800s. And this picture from the same collection shows the classic US thatched house, or Tai Tui, as they are known here, in its final form. North US heavily indented shores and favorable tidal range and cycle ensured that it was at the center of the steadily expanding kelp industry between 1750 and 1813. By 1800, the number of settlements had increased to nearly 50, and the number of tenants to around 300, with an estimated population of 2,900. This expansion included the migration of new families from other parts of the Outer Hebrides, Sky, and the mainland. As shown in this slide by the red dots, most of the new kelping related settlements were situated on the island's east coast, where the best types of seaweed grew, and their layouts anticipated a radical land reorganization that was about to be imposed on North US older communities by being spaced out rather than grouped closely together and each house situated within its own land holding. In 1813, the McDonald's of Slate decided to reorganize North US into Crofts and this extract from a state map of North US dated 89 is overdrawn, is overdrawn to show how two neighboring 18th century nucleated bulchine, highlighted in yellow here, were reorganized into individual crofts. The process started in, in 1814, although it wasn't completed until around 1850. North Uist's history then followed a similar and familiar pattern of many, either, many other highland communities with clearances, sheep, emigration, potato blight, and destitution. Like many other landlords in the Hebrides, the McDonald's and Slate became increasingly indebted during this period, and North US was finally sold in 1855. 
what I want to do now is go back to 1266 and just go just sketch out what we do know about buildings and settlements in the 500 year period that followed. Soon after the Hebrides became part of the Kingdom of Scotland, Ewes became part of the Clan McCrury lands, who had their main base in the Morgan and Ardnamurchan area. Apart from this one late Norse period house on the south west, which is dated to around 1250 to 1300, there is no real evidence that anyone was living on the east at that time. In fact, the first reliably dated building on North Lewis is not recorded until 1340, when Amy McCrory, the then divorced wife of John MacDonald of Isla, first Lord of the Isles, had this small chapel built on the island of Grimsley, which in fact is where I now live. It was one of a series of chapels, churches and monasteries that were built on North, North Uist up to the Reformation, at which point most were abandoned and the island, in fact, appears to become a pretty godless place until the 17th century. Here are three examples of ecclesiastical sites on North Uist, which in range and size from a substantial monastic establishment at Caranish, shown here lower left, which may have been home to an abbot at one time, a small rectangular chapel within an enclosure shown upper left, which is right on North Uist, northwest coast, and tiny outposts like the possible uh, little chapel themselves shown lower right, um, which we discovered on the island of Rone um, a couple of years ago. It seems reasonable to presume that small communities grew up around the two larger of these establishments for mutual protection and service. North Uist has no late medieval castles, although three were built further south, two again reputed by the McCrurys in the 14th century. It is presumed that these were the homes, strongholds of the elite families in this period, when of course all of Uist were still held as a single entity. What North Uist, North Uist does have is a significant number of Iron Age doom reoccupations from this period. Possibly as life became increasingly violent and insecure in the 16th century after Uist was divided. These reoccupations are characterized by the building of rectangular stone buildings, either within or on top of the original Iron Age circular forts, as shown by these three examples here. And I've just got another one behind my head here, um, which you can see is actually another picture of um, Dunan Sticker, which, I'm going, which is just shown on this slide here. As well as the main hall type structure, there are usually a number of outbuildings, which one presumes were occupied in part by other family members, servants, or guards. These structures were often associated in oral history with dark deeds perpetuated by various senior members of the different McDonald clan sets, hence the ability to date their occupation. The Battle of Caranish in 1606 between the McLeods and the McDonalds was the last major confrontation between the two farm families, apart from local skirmishes and cattle weaving. The statutes of Iona, which followed in 1609, brought relative peace to the whole area. Soon after, Donald Gorm Og MacDonald inherited Slate and North Uist, and he was made first Baron of Slate by James I. Some historians view this moment as being the end of the medieval period in Uist, although it remains a much debated point. Not a great deal is heard about North Uist in the century that followed, although from early charters, it seems that by this time, around a dozen named settlements probably existed. And by the time of the Blau of around 1650, that number had grown to as many as 25. The Blau map is believed to be based on an earlier survey work in around 1600 by Timothy Pont. So the number of settlements in 1600 may have been higher than 12, although some were almost certainly just single farmsteads. It's worth noting the two island settlements on the Blau map of North Uist, their locations highlighted here in yellow, so Doon Rannell and Doon and Sticker again down the bottom, although in this it's called Doonanech, showing that these former Iron Age dunes were still occupied around this time. Although the fortunes of the McDonald's of Slate waxed and waned over the 17th century, 
both the family and its influence steadily increased. And by the beginning of the 18th century, these cadet families who lived on and controlled most of North Uist had sufficient wealth to start building increasingly lavish houses for themselves. Although at first these houses were simply larger versions of the traditional thatched farmstead, such as at Val Reynolds shown here top left, by the time Ewan MacDonald of Ballet built his house in 1727, shown here to the lower left, the designs and construction techniques of the West Highland Laird style houses with features such as crow step gables were being adopted. The Maclean's of Borrowray were also significant holders of land on North Uist at the time, after one of the sons married one of the Slate MacDonald daughters in the late 17th century, and the remains of their early 18th century farmhouse at Cannon on Grimsley can be seen lower left. So let's just briefly summarize what we know about this 500 year period spanning the late Middle Ages and early modern period so far. The best preserved remains are the castles, fortified houses and tack farms of the elite families. There are a number of churches and chapels, although it seems likely that most, if not all, fell into disuse after the Reformation. But where and in what did the so-called common people live, a phrase devised by Ian Ahmed in his 1996 book on the archaeology of the Sky and the Western Isles? There are two main current theories um, about how settlements developed on the US after 1266. Following their survey and excavation work on South Uist, Mike Parker Pearson and Neil Sharples developed a so-called continuity theory. Around the same time, Robert Ocean of Aberystwyth University proposed a different theory, which was based on the gradual nucleation of formerly dispersed settlements. And both Ian Armit and John Raven, who were writing about their own researches a few years later, added their own thoughts to these ideas. Looking at the Mike Parker Pearson and Neil Sharples continuity theory, first of all, they had excavated a number of Iron Age, Norse and late medieval period sites on South Uist during the search project in the 1990s. And although Mike Parker Pearson admitted that they did not have a complete picture, especially for the 300 year period after around 1350, they took the view that patterns of settlement layout were established in the Middle Iron Age and that these have been broadly maintained right through to today. Their sequence of events starts around the turn of the first millennium with the construction of a multiple of multiple round and wheelhouse sites along the Macca. Just inland, a series of fortified islands, the dunes, seem to reflect this pattern. As well as cultivating grain crops on the Macca, the Iron Age peoples also kept sheep and cattle and it seems very likely that these were grazed in the hills during the summer months, either using huts or possible summer roundhouses, of which a number exist on the east side of the island and in the hills. Moving forward to the Norse period. So I've just got, um, yeah. Moving forward to the Norse period, they discovered a number of Norse settlement mounds in the Macca, often in land at the earlier Iron Age round houses, by then buried by blown, wind blown sand. Their excavation revealed continuous occupation of the same sites over 250 years after around 1000 AD, with several reconstructions taking place. In the process, houses became increasingly less Norse like in plan with their curved long elevations steadily moving towards a final form that, as we have seen earlier, was almost perfectly rectangular in plan. They found that the Norse settlement locations tended to follow the Iron Age patterns already established, although it seems unlikely that one followed the other in time. It seems certain that the Norse settlers also adopted the summer transhumance traditions of their homelands and also used the hill shielings inland. Not long after the Norse lost control of the Hebrides in the mid 13th century, it seems that the Norse Macca settlements were mostly abandoned, possibly because of some kind of climate event which caused increasingly amounts of sand blow. Inland of the Macca edge in what is known as Blackland, areas of lower lying and better trained peat moorland that could be fertilized with seaweed and shell sand from the nearby coast 
the Schertz group discovered evidence of two late medieval settlement sites comprising clusters of small, mostly turf wall buildings. However, evidence is extremely sparse. One explanation for so many remains may be that the population of the US was very small at the time, especially as the Makruris, the then owners, had their main base on the mainland. After Clan Reynolds gained control of South Uist in around 1600, it seems that the population started to grow again. And Mike Parker Pearson believes that it was around this time that the nucleated Bale development started, with some located in the Black Land and some moving back onto the Maka, which by this time seems to have stabilized again, perhaps, perhaps because of improved agricultural techniques. However, their main point was that the way the land was divided and settlement generally located appeared to follow the pattern established by the Norse and Iron Age people in the previous centuries. The map here on the left, drawn by John Rabin from the Search Project Discoveries, show how, shows how Norse period settlement relates to modern township boundaries on South Uist. On the right, you can see one of the two late Neolithic medieval settlements at Gary Valtos test, which was test fitted during the search project. A reference to the place name in the chart of 1500 suggests it was in existence by this date, although they didn't actually find any dateable finds when they were excavating. The settlement settlement, sorry, the second settlement development hypothesis was put forward by Professor Robert Doshin, a geographer from Aberystwyth University in 1993. This caused something of an upset when it was published, as this coincided in time with a survey work being undertaken by the search team on South Uist and who were developing at the time their own continuity theory. Doshin's main argument, derived from years of research in late medieval period, agricultural practice, land divisions, and taxation across the highlands was that bail development happened both later and more sporadically than proposed by search. Rochin said there was clear evidence of continuing dispersed settlement in the early modern period, citing examples on Skye, such as here at Gorafiuk on the Waltonish Peninsula and elsewhere. He suggested furthermore that because of the general impermanence and the insecurity of life that existed during the 15th and 16th centuries, the way land was taxed and a likely small population, there was little incentive for the nucleated bale to develop at the time. Robert Doshin suggested that not all the houses would have been occupied at the same time, and in fact families may have had three or four such small houses that they moved between at different times of the year, including shooting sites, to ensure that their stock, the then prime source of agricultural production and income, had the optimum grazing. <clears throat> Shown on this slide is his diagrammatic plan of Borough from his 1993 paper, and this shows the location of the buildings in the small fields visible in the previous satellite image more clearly. It has to be said that not everyone agreed with this idea, especially Mike Parker Pearson, unsurprisingly, who said Dodgson's theory was very much at odds with what they had discovered in the late medieval period on South Uist where settlements already appeared to be nucleated by around 1500. Although in truth, the numbers of examples both academics were citing were very small. Ian Arnott believed that to an extent at least his already completed excavation, excavation work on two sites on the shores of Loch Olivet in North Uist supported Robert Dodgson's ideas in late bale development, especially as to him the theory reflected what was known about settlement developed in the late medieval period in other parts of Europe. His survey and excavations had revealed the remains of a number of small huts lying within the traces of bounded fields, which appeared to fit the Dodgson dispersed model. Here are images of the two Loch Olivet sites today with the hut plans shown upper left. As noted, it appears to have been occupied sporadically between the 14th and 17th centuries. John Rabin worked on several parts of the search project in South Uist in the 90s, and in the early 2000s returned to Uist to research his PhD, the subject of which was the island's late medieval landscapes between 1000 AD and 1650. 
He was particularly interested in the Iron Age island dunes, a number of which had been reoccupied towards the end of the late medieval period. John believed that these and notable differences in the size of Lake Norse farmsteads and the status of finds they contained showed an increasing move towards a feudal type of land holding structure which started in the late Norse period and was largely complete by 1400, around the time North US was separated from the South US and Dumbecula. He noticed, that, he noticed, however, a significant gap in recorded sites in the period between 1400 and 1550, and felt that this missing period represented a time when communities and settlements changed from being dispersed to nucleated. This he suggested was part of a transition between this feudal system and one related to clanship, more akin to land holding in Gallic Island than Europe. What I want to do now is reflect on these different settlement development ideas in the light of our own field survey work on North Europe in recent years. Looking firstly at the Parker Post and Sharples continuity theory, if we take the earlier map of North US Iron Age sites shown here on the left, we can see these are pretty much scattered across the whole island. If we then compare it with a map of nucleated bell settlements in around 1750 on the right, I think two conclusions can be drawn. Firstly, there are a significant number of 18th century communities which do not relate at all to Iron Age ones. And secondly, in such a small and strongly bound case, a mathematician will, prob mathematician will probably say the chances of random coincidence of settlement locations were quite high anyway. There are inevitably exceptions to this case which support the continuity idea to a degree. The first is the site at Oodle, excavated by Ian Crawford in the 1960s and 70s, circled orange in the left-hand map, where he believed there had been continuous occupation of the site from, an, from the Iron Age right through to around 1600, when it was abandoned. The second is at Foshagay, circled pink in both maps, where a secondary settlement related to Griminish and still in use up until around 1825, actually overlies an Iron Age wheelhouse village that was excavated by Erskine Beveridge in the early 1900s. In addition, it could be argued that the late medieval reoccupation of Iron Age dunes represented a kind of continuity, although there is no real reason why, alternatively, this couldn't be described as the opportunist, opportunistic reuse of an existing building resource. Moving on to Robert Dodgson's theory of early dispersed settlement followed by late bale development, to support this idea, we would firstly need to see the, these kind of land use patterns of small fields and huts he saw on sky. Secondly, there should be little or no evidence of larger nucleated settlements until 1700 or so. <clears throat> After noticing the odd unrecorded hut near Ian Arnold's excavations around Loch Olivet, we surveyed Gary sites in the surrounding area last year and have found significant numbers of other huts located within closed fields in patterns similar to those recorded by him on sky. The examples shown on this slide here are located on rising ground just in land of a line of three settlements a mile or two southwest of Loch Olivet, one of which, Palomartin, is recorded in Charter dating to 1469. In this other example, these four huts and fuel boundary and cultivation remains lie just north of Ian Arnott's excavations at Loch Olivet in the settlement of Grimanish, another that is recorded in the 1469 charter. And here are thumbnail plans of all the huts surveyed in these areas. As you can see, they come in all different shapes and sizes, but with one or two minor exceptions, turf walls predominate. So the question arises, are these the remains of the dwellings of Robert Dodgson's nomadic peoples at the end of the medieval period, or are they related to other functions and times? These might include shelters of the so-called grass keepers or corietti watchers, uh, the Gallic word for watchers, who were paid by fellow crofters to stop livestock getting into crops. Or perhaps they're sheeting huts lying just outside settlement head dikes, which are rare on the US but not un unknown elsewhere. Or perhaps these relate to some temporary response to a sandblow event in the Macca fields down towards the coast, a number of which were recorded during the late 18th century in this area. Anyway, clearly only excavation and dating will tell. 
Then as regards Robert Dodgson's idea of late bail development, this is more difficult to prove because although around 30 settlements are recorded by both the Blau mapping and 1750 estate rental, we have no real idea as to whether these were single farms or multiple household settlements. What we can say is there was significant expansion of the number and size of settlements of population between 1764 and 1813, mostly due to the booming kelp industry. This late development theory is further supported by the very late dates of the very few datable thatched houses on Eurist. The earliest on North Eurist are two isolated farmsteads near the North Eurist southeast coast, shown top left in this slide, which are occupied by the Bard John McCodron in the 1770s. On South Eurist, the search team carried out excavations on two thatched house sites in the 1990s in the belief that they were late 17th or early 18th century in date, including the supposedly well-recorded and indeed signposted birthplace of Flora MacDonald, who was born in 1722. But in both cases, the finds from the excavations revealed that they were constructed between around 1780 and 1790, and neither overlay any earlier structures. Similar dates were found at more recent Black House excavations on the Isle of Lewis, again targeted because they were believed locally to be much older. And of course, the most iconic of all Hebridean black houses located at Arnold in Lewis and shown here in the center of the picture was not built until 1885. And finally, on North Uist, what about John Raven's ideas about the role of reoccupied medieval dunes? Shown here on this map. If we add North Uist recorded sheeling sites to this map of island dunes, reoccupied in the late medieval period, we get this combination. In our recent survey work on these two building types, we couldn't help noticing that when walking out to the remote dunes in the island's hinterland, we were able to pick up a number of nearby sheeling sites on the way. And what we're now starting to think is that in some cases, there is a good possibility that these two building types may be connected in time as well as geography, as shown in this next slide. As a result, we think that there might well be a period, possibly in the late 15th and 16th centuries, when there was another type of settlement pattern which was focused on the reoccupied dunes, as suggested by John, suggested by John Raven, but very widely dispersed across the whole island and not just in the north and west coast Macca areas. And what we have found at some of the sheeting sites located close to reoccupied dunes are more substantial rectangular plan huts rather than the classic small circular ones, suggesting they may have been occupied more permanently. So what conclusions might we draw from our own survey work about these main settlement theories and how they appear to apply to North Uist? On balance, the dispersed settlement of idea of Robert Dodgson seems to fit better with what we have here than the continuity ideas of the search project. As we have seen, although there are occasional set settlements of settlement continuity, these appear to be quite rare. And finally, we have the possibility of North Uist or North Uist of another type of settlement pattern around the 16th century, although this needs more survey work before it can be properly checked. And so to finish, where do we think the common people, as Ian Arnott called them, lived between 1266 and 1750? The only real certainty from this 500 year period is that the use of shielings is likely to have continued throughout, such as at the site of six circular huts and two rock shelters on the remains of a former chambered cairn. It seems clear that the reoccupation of the Iron Age island dunes in the late medieval period would have been led by the heads of the more important and possibly more powerful North Use families and they presumably stayed in the larger rectangular buildings on these sites, such as this one in Loch Huna in central North Uist. However, these sites often include numbers of ancillary buildings, and there's a good chance that followers and servants occupied these. Perhaps something like this, uh, as shown here in this artist's reconstruction of the reoccupied Dunan sticker in around 1500. 
The new idea that these reoccupied dunes included other onshore settlement nearby seems to have some credibility, especially as it would have been difficult to keep livestock on islands for any length of time. In this slide here is a small set of buildings in the foreground on the hill above Dune and Sticker, highlighted in yellow in the distance. And going back to Dune Barn in Lochuna, here is a similar set of buildings overlooking the, that reoccupied dun, again highlighted in yellow in the distance. Unfortunately, the lack of excavation and formal dating evidence of late medieval buildings on North, North Hughes continues to hinder dating of possible dwellings from this period. But there are just two examples dated from pottery samples found on their floors. The one on the left of the Grimsey wheelhouse and the other at Ian Crawford's oodle excavations in the 1960s. And you can see the wheelhouse, the little oval building at the bottom of the wheelhouse is dated around 1300. And at um, Ian Crawford's oodle excavations around 1400 to 1650. The only other dated building examples on North Hughes from this period are those excavated by Ian Armit and Grim Madurke and Eileen Olivert, we saw earlier. So to end with a brief summary, although most of the houses of the common people who lived on North Hughes between 1266 and 1750 have disappeared forever, traces do remain. The most numerous are the Sheen huts, likely to be several hundred in total, although recent survey work suggests the possibility that some may not have been sheenings at all. Also still visible from the period are the secondary buildings related to reoccupied dunes, which well, may well have also provided living accommodation. And there are other examples of huts in or next to enclosed fields, which may belong to a wider transhumanist transition that was carried out all year. That's it. So my thanks are due to all those who helped the survey and reporting work. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. David, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um,